Hello you lovely lot and welcome back to a brand new video for a brand new year. My name is Katie and I thought I'd use up a few supplies I already have. Now the festive period is over, I feel like I can start using some of the supplies from the Upcrate advent calendar. And I thought the scratch boards that we got in the calendar would be a great place to start. If you didn't know, Upcrate also did a mystery box with these supplies in there and we only had two surfaces to work on, so I was actually quite pleased when they were in the advent calendar. However, if you haven't had that box before, you're not going to be able to do much scratching with it. But that aside, I had the equipment and I thought, let's see what else I can do with these, apart from just scratch. Ironically though, this is pretty much how this picture is going to get started. Now, if you'll remember back to that Upcrate video I made, I didn't use the black ampersand scratch board and I said I'd do a beyond the box, so I guess this kind of falls into that category too. And I must admit, there is not much room for error with this. As you can see, I had already sketched out my design on here and again, I'll leave links to my photo references. I can't recommend enough the free reference photos for artists group on Facebook. There are some amazing pictures from some amazing photographers. And I saw this particular picture, which I might flash on the screen somewhere. And I thought that would be perfect for this first picture I'm doing. Now with the Upcrate box, we had the tools to do the job with. If you don't have them, then a simple Zacto knife or just something with a point that you can scratch that's gonna be sturdy will pretty much get the job done. However, there were two specialized tools in there. We had a diamond tipped blade as well as a curved blade. And yes, you can get more variety with your textures, but it really is one of those things where you've kind of just got to play about with it if you've not used them before. For me, this is the second time using these scratch boards. I know in my Upcrate video, I referred to doing them like about a million years ago when I was a teenager and you'd get those copper foiled ones. Yeah, some time indeed has passed since then. So I'm still quite a newbie at this. However, if you like to use things like white ink on black paper or metallic marker pens on black paper, it's not too dissimilar in principle. However, the application on the other hand is quite different. Of course, you can amend any mistakes you make by using some Indian ink on there. But we'll get to that a little later on in this video as to potential downsides of doing that. Also, you'll see, and that's probably definitely, in fact, user error, there is an annoying shine on the board. And what happened there was I'd sketched out something. I'd just put the rough outlines down. There was no need to draw the whole thing in, only to have to draw it all in again. However, when it came to trying to erase some of those pencil marks where I knew I wouldn't be scratching over, I decided to use a kneadable eraser. And even though it didn't lift up the whole surface, it definitely changed the finish of it. I have this very annoying shiny patch on there, which I will deal with a little later. But it is still very annoying. So as you can probably gather by now, I'm drawing an owl and it's a side profile view of it. So that's probably why it doesn't immediately look like an owl. I thought this subject matter would just be perfect for this medium because there's lots of lovely feathery line details in there. And that is what scratch boards pretty much are all about. For me, the most useful tool I've got, again, which came in the set, I would have to say is that curved blade there, as you could create a variety of thicknesses of lines and, well, I mean, I want to say brush strokes, but obviously it's not brush strokes, so would it be scratch strokes? Hmm, answers down below. I liked the curved tool though, again, you've got that variety of strokes, but I also felt as well that for areas which I really needed to carve out a lot, then it wasn't a problem, as well as creating, I suppose, de defined borders. As you can see the face of the owl and then where the smaller feathers are surrounding it, you know how they've sort of got that, 
I always think it's like a little satellite dish on owls. And I suppose maybe it kind of works on that principle. But yeah, we'll call it the satellite dish part of the owl. Being able to just create a more defined outline without actually having to scroll an outline on there, that is so useful. And again, having that thicker curve on the blade, I guess, it just means I can obviously put those more dense feather details in there too. And if you're a little bit lazy like me and you can't be bothered to pick up the little diamond tool or the Zacto knife, then if you hold it in a certain way, I guess a little bit like a chisel tip marker or liner pen, you can still get a relatively fine line on there, although you're not going to quite get as much control. So I definitely wouldn't recommend using the curved blade for really long lines that are going to be thin. I'd definitely, definitely swap it over. So whilst past me is carving away there, I might as well have a little chat with you guys. Did you have a nice holiday period? Did you get any interesting art supplies? And I'd like to ask you as well, did you get some supplies and you're like, I really want to know how to use these, but I haven't got a clue? If you want me to try and make a video for you, perhaps just going through a few of the basics, I can try and do that and I'd be more than happy as well, especially if it's a medium I haven't used for a while. It's always nice to dig up these things. As for me, I had no art supplies for Christmas this year, apart from the Crayola Colours of the World set and a very nice sausage roll shaped pencil case. One of my good friends got that for me for Christmas and this friend will be referred to as a lovely cup of tea. You know who you are. Thank you so much. I must admit, I had never tried the Colours of the World ones before, so it's actually quite nice to have some skin tones to play about with. And I don't mind a bit of Crayola, I'll be honest with you. I'm pretty sure most of us, a lot of us, have used Crayola growing up, and I guess that's probably what's led us all to be passionate about art. When I was a very, very, very young Katie Riles art, I had a Crayola studio set. It was like in this big red briefcase and it had a bit of everything in there. And I was in absolute heaven. And the following year I asked Santa for the very same one and I got another one because I'd used everything up. Crayola is wonderful. And I quite like using it now. I think it's great just to add a chuck just chuck a bit of colour on something just for a few concept sketches. They're great. Anyway, I am in danger of waffling, so let's talk a little bit more about what's going on here. So I had pretty much done the scraping for this part of the picture. Again, perhaps just adding a few finer strokes in between those thicker ones just to I guess soften some of those edges there and I thought it would be a great idea to add a little bit of colour. I thought I'd try a variety of inks so I've used the Magic Colour Acrylic inks which we had in a scroll box a while ago last year as well as some of the Windsor & Newton, I think it was the Cobalt Blue and of course the Indian ink that came with the Upcrate box. I started off by using the Windsor & Newton and I did dilute it somewhat. I wondered if the finish of the dried ink would actually impact the texture of the scratch board, but I was happy to say that no issues arise and it looks quite nice and I just wanted to tint it. I really wanted the eye to be striking on this as well, so those acrylic inks were perfect for the job. And again, there wasn't too much of a difference between finish of the dried ink and the dry, well, on the scratch board. However, this is possibly where it didn't quite go how I wanted it to. I went over the whole black background again with the Indian ink and, well, it definitely made it look a lot richer. However, it didn't dry very evenly and I really did try and make sure it was an even coat but it was drying before I could get back to it and yeah it's a little bit streaky. Never mind. I actually think maybe going over it in some varnish might remedy that. I just don't like the shiny bits on there, it kind of distracts the eye away from all the bits I've scraped in so if I do decide to varnish it I will let you guys know. Anyway on to picture number two. Of course I had just one white ampersand board and again that was from the Upcrate calendar. 
If you did watch the unboxing video though where these were included, you'll notice that I just did the ink on the whiteboard technique similar to what I'm doing now. And I was really happy with how that came out. I thought the black crow that I'd done in the foreground against that pristine white background looked really effective. And I also quite enjoyed being able to choose the shape of what I was doing in the foreground, if that makes any sense. So I thought I'd adopt that same principle, but using some coloured ink instead. Again, it's using those Magic Colour acrylic inks, and I literally just splodged it on there. I didn't want it to be too neat. I actually didn't mind there being all these weird textures in there because I'm going to carve into it anyway, so it's not too bad. And as you'll know, I am still on a little personal mission to loosen up my style, so it's a start, right? I used the Indian ink to just add some suggestions of stripes in there, and yes, I can go back into it later, and I do. But that pretty much acts as my sketching it out. There was no pencil included this time on the idea, so I just went straight in there. So yeah, it might look a little bit off, but it doesn't look terrible. Now, one of the things I did notice about using it with acrylic ink was the texture when it came to scraping was a lot different than using the Indian ink and quite possibly as well the Windsor and Newton ink, although I don't use that on here, but basing it on how I know these supplies are going to dry and finish, I think the drawing ink would probably be better just for future reference there. The thing I found about using the acrylic ink was it would scratch fine, but like all the little shavings and the dust that came off, it was quite gummy. And it's it's kind of difficult to describe, but it was gummy. And when I tried to remove them, I'd find that these little crumbs would just end up sitting in what I'd carved. And it, it was just a bit of a hassle trying to clear the board each time. And I suppose you have to bear in mind as well, acrylic paint and acrylic ink, once it's dry, I guess it does remain relatively flexible because it is quite a plasticky kind of paint. So yeah, that, I should have taken that into consideration really. It's not the end of the world, it was just more of a minor inconvenience. With that being said though, I actually still found that this technique was actually really nice and effective. I absolutely loved the contrast of scraping through to that whiteboard and just having it right next to those vibrant colours. I do advise that if you are going to use coloured inks, preferably something like a drawing ink and not an acrylic ink, I would definitely go for vibrant colours. I think if you went for pastel tones, especially if you're going to use fine scratches on the board. It's going to be a little bit too subtle and you might not see it, but by all means, give it a try. But just be warned, your white marks underneath might not show up quite as much as you'd want it to. Now, I know some of you guys probably have had that upgrade box or the advent calendar or both, but for those of you who haven't had those upgrade boxes, have you tried this medium before as well? And what did you think? Have you tried adding the inks on the top of a whiteboard, for example, and then carving into it? Or do you not carve into it at all and just appreciate what a unique surface this is to begin with? If these boards weren't so expensive, I think I would actually quite enjoy doing a painting on these and I might even be persuaded to go back to acrylics. Acrylic paints are not a huge favourite of mine. I think it was a case of just overusing them back in college and back in university and I'm kind of over it a little bit now. It's like when you eat too much of your favourite biscuit, for example, or whatever your favourite food is and then you don't want to eat any more of it. That's kind of what happens with acrylic paints for me, I'm afraid. I'm also not a big lover of painting on canvas. Maybe not so much with oils. I think, yeah, it's okay. But in general, I'm not a huge canvas fan. I like a pretty smooth texture to work on, especially if I'm adding lots of details in there. With that being said though, I did go and buy myself a nice round canvas the other day because I've got loads of acrylic paints that I do want to use up. So any suggestions for what would be on there? It's a nice big round canvas and I'll take them into consideration. I might even do a video on it actually, but it's quite a big canvas and yikes, I might have to appear on that video too. 
oh goodness as well you're going to see what an absolute bomb site my uh, studio is as well so yeah hmm i'll have to think about that one <laughs> Anyway, totally missed a big part of the picture going on there, so I decided to add a deep green background, and that was combining the Indian ink along with those acrylic inks. Because I just wanted that contrast, and for the fur details, especially on the outline of the tiger, I thought that would just make it pop out a little bit more, and it also addressed some of those little janky edges which weren't quite the tiger shape I wanted. Part of me was tempted a little to add some textures in the background there with the scraping tools, but I did decide against it in the end. I actually kind of liked the textures that naturally occurred from the inks, and I just wanted to leave it at that. Plus, of course, a tiger is a very patterned creature, so I think maybe having stuff going on in the background there probably might have conflicted a little bit with the tiger in the foreground there, so... Yeah, there's a nice balance, I think. To get all those finer fur details down and just general form of this magnificent beast, I did find myself interchanging quite a lot between the curved blade and the diamond tool. I did find it a little bit more difficult specifically with that curved tool, and again, that's just down to the gummy, sticky, horrible crumbs of the acrylic ink that was coming off. And Oh well, it's just one of those things, you just have to keep making sure that your surface is cleaned off regularly. For those persistent bits of dust and gunk that fall into the grooves you've carved, I did find that the diamond tool was particularly helpful at removing some of them, and for the more stubborn parts as well, the Zacto knife definitely came in handy because it just had a bit of a sturdier blade and it was just, it, it, they kind of pinged out the little crumbs did, so that, that made a good difference there too. Now, I was going to leave the stripes on this tiger just as the solid black, but as I was sort of looking at the picture and as it was evolving in front of me, it did actually look a little bit odd. And I think it's down to the fact that those lines for those stripes were just really thick and chunky. And comparing it to those fine lines of the fur, it, it just, it, I just wasn't feeling it to be honest. So once I'd scratched some of them in, I did extend some of those lines a little bit further by using a Faber-Castell pen. And I specifically chose Faber-Castell because that does contain Indian ink, so that, that just seemed like the natural choice to go with. However, if you don't have Faber-Castell, I'm pretty sure a, a Micron pen or the Unipin pens will be just as good. This was also handy as well for just sort of going over a few spots where maybe I'd carved a little bit too much and as well it just helped add a little bit of that definition in there. I also as well decided to include the grey Faber-Castell pit pens. Again it says they're Indian ink so that just seemed like a logical fit and as well I also have the sepia, sepia, however you pronounce it and that just sort of reintroduced some colour to some of the areas where I might have scraped a little bit too hard and because it was a slightly different tone to what I'd painted down it was quite nice actually because I didn't lose those marks that I'd carved in it just sort of added a different tone of what I'd carved in and that I think that looked a lot better. Pretty much though both of the pieces that I've done today I've been experimental. I mean, this is the third one I've ever done and I'm still going to be learning. I might save up and get some more of these boards though because I do find it very cathartic. Although I can understand it not being for everyone, especially if you don't like hearing noises that scrape. And thank goodness I do a voiceover and don't do it live because I think you probably would have all tuned out by now. However, that doesn't seem to bother me so much. I guess I better do a bit of a conclusion here. So I really like the ampersand boards. Again, my favorite, I guess, is gonna be the white one. However, I do like the contrast created with the blackboard. I still have one of those left, so I might revisit that in another video. The downside to using that blackboard, and again, that's down to user error, is it's very texture sensitive. If you hold your hand over it for too long, the oils off your hands are gonna affect the finish of the board, as well as if you try and erase off it. Never mind. 
it's all a learning process and the more of them I do, hopefully the less mistakes I'm going to make as I go along and you can apply that to any new medium that you're starting with. I guess with anything though, if you're used to one medium and you're trying out a new one, certain things you can carry across from one medium to another, whether it be techniques or just overall aesthetics. And you're also going to learn that some techniques and some aesthetics aren't going to work either. Don't be too down on yourself if that happens though. Just make a note of it. Take that knowledge to your next piece. That's the best advice anyone can give you really, especially if you're new to art or again, like I mentioned, a new medium. As you'll see, it is finishing touches time for the tiger. Just got to add those whiskers in there and that curved blade was perfect for it. That really made them stand out. However, I did have to just go and pick through a little bit more with that Zacto knife. I decided just for good measure, I might just introduce a little bit of yellow on there, just where the sepia didn't quite add much to it. And I was quite happy with it. So here's a little recap of what I've done. I do like the owl. I just wish that background wasn't such a streaky mess. But hey, if I varnish it, I will let you guys know how it goes and whether I'd recommend doing it or not. But I've got no varnishing at the moment, so it's not going to happen anytime soon. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And feel free to leave either a tiger or a owl emoji. Let me know which one's your favorite. For me, the owl's the favorite, but I learned a lot from the tiger. So make of that what you will. If you fancy watching some more videos, I'm gonna leave a couple on screen that I think you're gonna enjoy. So by all means, click one of those. And of course, if you haven't already, why not give that subscribe button a little nudge too. Thank you as always for watching and I'll see you lovely lot soon. Bye.